And as a longtime advocate of mental health, I'm thrilled and honored um, to introduce our speakers to you tonight. Um, I'm going to start out with Janet. Um, Janet Shaver is currently the pastor at Middlebury Church of the Brethren. Her career, both before and after becoming a pastor, is characterized by the fact that she loves working with people. From banking to fitness gyms to chaplain at correctional facilities and hospitals, she has come to deeply believe that you are never alone. She feels that her career has been guided by grace, which she defines as the unconditional love that the universe has for each of us. Her work in hospitals and jails has shown her that we can walk through the shadow places that we all have and make choices that lead to joy. Jana holds a BA in communications from Carlo University in Pittsburgh and a master's in divinity from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Dr. Frank Lamus is an individual marriage and family therapist who is currently in private practice in Reno, Nevada, the place he has called home for all but the first two years of his life. His 30 plus years of practice has also included working to strengthen relationships within organizations, ranging from private companies to government agencies, and his many conference and workshop presentations. He has written a book titled Relationship DNA, which he presents the core concepts he has learned in his work and life experiences, which include being an immigrant son, championship athlete, award-winning graduate student, Vietnam veteran, and coach. He is also a husband, father, and grandfather. Frank received his formal education from the University of Nevada at Reno. Thank you, Frank and Janet, um, for being with us tonight. And we're looking forward to what you have to um, have us think about. And Frank, I'm going to turn it over to you. I believe you're going to start us out. I am. All right. Anyway, uh, first of all, welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Our primary focus uh, during this discussion will be on understanding loneliness. The COVID pandemic has created not only a serious mental health crisis, but also a serious mental health crisis. We find ourselves having to protect ourselves and our loved ones by isolating and staying away from the very people who give us a reason for living. We find ourselves being hypervigilant about getting sick, and maybe dying, as well as being afraid to be around others for fear that we may spread the virus to them and make them sick or cause them to die. So after more, for more than a year of this, most of us are either numb, tired, or exhausted from the isolation and aloneness that we have all had to endure. The lockdowns and the restrictions that have come from the COVID-19 pandemic have created a loneliness which can eventually become loneliness. This feeling of loneliness that overcomes us is an insidious and eroding force that robs us of connections, which is, which really is our lifeline to well-being. I think those connections really are what allows us to feel a sense of well-being. I believe that when most people talk about feelings of loneliness, they're really experiencing feelings that come from their disconnection separation and distance from others. As a human species, relationships are part of our evolution and our built-in survival mechanism. Not only the survival that comes from being a part of a community or a group, but a survival that comes from our internal sense of what I call sanity. Sanity is an acronym that I created that stands for the power and the energy that a sense of connection gives us. Sanity is connection. 
And that connection comes through having relationships. Real quickly, I'm gonna go through what each of the letters in the acronym stand for. The S stands for the power and energy that comes from a feeling a sense of safety, protection, and security. It's the primary part of any relationship. If you don't feel safe, you don't feel protected, you don't feel secure, it's really hard to create any kind of collect connection. The second one, the A stands for acceptance. And that means acceptance as a person and not as an object. And as most of us realize, the difference between a person and an object is that a person has feelings, while objects are for us to use without regard to feeling. The N stands for a sense of nurturance. That's when we're with somebody that makes us feel filled up. We have a sense of being full as opposed to being around people where we're with them for a little by a bit and then we just feel absolutely drained. So the S is for safety, the A is for acceptance, the N, N is for nurturance. The I in sanity stands for a sense of importance. When we feel valued, when we feel significant, we feel worthy. Those are the people that we want to spend our time with and the ones that we want to enter relationships with. The T stands for a sense of trust and dependability. It's that key that, that we need to have when somebody says they're going to do something, we can count on the fact that they're going to do it. Or if they say they're going to be a certain way, we can depend on the fact that that's who they're going to show up as. And the Y key to me is always the one that is a critical in creating any relationship because the Y really stands for the word yes. And it stands for yes, I'm better with you than without you. And for those of you who are in relationships, what allows that relationship to bond and stay together is a sense that I like. It's like, yes, I like the way I look through your eyes. And yes, I like the way I see myself when I'm next to you. I always love it when I say that to Judy is that, man, I love the way I look through Judy's eyes. I mean, I love that the fact that she sees Roberto Mon Roberto Montalban, you know what I mean? I just really love that. And that makes me feel good. Well, that's the yes key in the sanity. These six experiences, safety, acceptance, nurturance, importance, trust. Yes, I'm better with you than without you are what create connections. These connections are what we as humans need for our physical and emotional well-being. When we lack relationships like we have and what, how we feel now during this pandemic and the sanity, these connections, without the sanity, these connections don't really happen, right? So when we lack relationships and the sanity these collections normally provide us, many times our mental health actually suffers and anxiety and depression can follow. The most important relationship we lose is the relationship with ourselves. We begin to disconnect from that inner power that we feel, that life energy, what we call our life force, that feeds our connection to our heart, our soul, and our spirit. So while it's important that when we lose relationships with others, I think it's even more important when we lose relationships with ourselves. This important discussion that we're having today is about how to create a better relationship and connection with others, as well as with ourselves. It's about how to recreate and reinvigorate our inner power and the life energy, which is our life force. So for the next part of our discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Luann or Janet, I'm not sure. Uh, and then what will happen is after Janet's finished, I'm going to return with some of my ideas on how to get the power and energy or our life force back in order to beat that sense of lonesomeness. All right, so I'll hand it off. And I'm looking forward to just telling you, um, my own experience with loneliness. I wanted to say that my husband is on, but I, I think that you all saw him and he's, I have to give him his church a plug. Uh, he's the pastor at Napanee Church of the Brethren. Uh, so tonight I just wanna do a disclaimer. When, if I'm talking about God, um, know that I'm talking um, in my own language, but I 
I welcome any language, you know, any faith language that you have, any language that you call um, anything that's a higher power than yourself, grace or the universe or the divine or holy, um, you can name, um, name that. And I think that's important for me to say because I'm a Christian pastor, I'm just, that's my um, common language or sometimes I, res I respond with grace or with um, the universe. So I can, I can also use different language. Uh, so what I wanna say is I think that most of us have had bouts of loneliness um, in some degree or another. And I think like after a death of a loved one or um, uh, loss of employment or any traumatic event uh, that you've had where you're transitioning from, uh, they call that a liminal space where you, you're leaving behind something that was dear to you moving forward into something that's unknown and you have no idea. And so you find yourself on this threshold of a place where um, that offers lots of hope and promise but it's a place of fear sometime as well. And I think that we have to understand that. I think for me, um, in my own uh, time of loneliness, it was because I had lived in Pennsylvania uh, my entire life. And then all of a sudden I ended up in Indiana and it was such a shock to me. I didn't expect that after seminary, I thought I would just go back to um, at least the vicinity where I, where I lived and I didn't, uh, God brought me here. And I know it was a, I know that was a God call. Um, Burl and I had been on uh, so many interviews and, uh, and they were all good interviews, uh, but no calls at all. And uh, Napanee called us. And when I realized we were coming here, it just set me into this kind of downward spiral. And I missed my friends and family uh, so much and the familiar places that I had known all my life. And I had this deep sense of loneliness and you know, it's, it's hard to really articulate um, when you're in the midst of that. And even after, because it's gone now, but if I reflect on it, I can remember some of like, just some of the deep sadness that I had. Um, and I wanna say um, in this is that there's like, to me, there's a fine line of depression and um, loneliness. I think you walk a fine line and it's really important for, you to stay in touch with your feelings because of that. So as I see it, you can be as lonely as anyone um, and still be in the midst of people. And that's what I wanna say is I had this deep sense of loneliness and there were people all around me and it, did, um, it just did not touch the loneliness that I had. And I think that's important. I wanna definitely get that across. So even if you're with a lot of people, it's normal to have loneliness um, uh, inside of you. I think one of the things I found my loneliness was is I lost my sense of identity, uh, who I thought I was and who, you know, where I came from and all of it was part of my identity. Richard Rohr, he's a Jesuit theologian and he does a lot of work in that false self and true self where a lot of times our false self is wrapped up in what we do for a living and our gender and our color of our skin, uh, where we, you know, our social location. And so I found that I was struggling with that false self. Uh, and um, I looked at this uh, as um, just this space where there was this vastness of emptiness. And another thing I think that caused that is I felt like I didn't have a sense of belonging. So the loneliness came from both of those things, a loss of identity and then not a sense of belonging. You know, who am I in this place and what is this place I'm in? And, um, and the culture was so different. And, and honestly, it was something I never experienced before. I was, my husband calls me a pod because I stayed in one place where I never moved around. And I think um, that, that cracks me up because I never saw myself that way. Um, I always thought I was adventurous and, um, I, I, and independent. And I realized, I never realized how much homesick I would be until I left my home. And that was really a shock. But when I found myself at what we call um, in the spiritual world, in a spiritual wilderness, I'm sure you've heard that term before. And um, I was on this 
threshold of a wilderness. Uh, and the threshold was actually inside the wilderness. And I didn't know where to go or what to do. And, um, and I want to say that um, wilderness is not a bad thing. And we look at it as a terribly draining thing or a dark space. And it can be. But it's, it can be a really a place of beauty as well. I'm an introvert and introverts um, love people, but they get their energy from being alone and quiet, like a contemplative. And um, so different from an extrovert where extroverts get their energy um, from other people. So they feel really spiritually energized when they're with people. And so it's we both love people. We just don't. Um, we just don't get our energy both in the same places. I was thinking Burl is an extrovert and I'm an introvert. So that took us a little, a little time to mesh ourselves together, to give ourselves space or or be together when when Burl, the extrovert, needed to have people, and for me, the introvert needed to have quiet space. So quiet is good wilderness in that place where you have opportunities to be alone is a good thing but not for a long long time and uh, because even introverts need people in their lives and i saw i see the pandemic um like uh, dr lima said the pandemic has been long and people have really suffered through so many things and i look at us as in a collective wilderness in the pandemic and that we're all we're all in this lonely place we're all in this alone place and and we've we've experienced the wilder this collective wilderness differently even though we're we're all we can all say that we all have that in common that we were um we were part of this pandemic wilderness and each one of us have experienced it in such a different way and it was so much longer than we could ever imagine. I was saying that uh, yesterday in church, I'm so glad that we never know what's happening next or in the future because um, we might've entered into the pandemic with a whole different mindset, with a whole, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. I think it could have, the wilderness could have been a lot worse. It, it, could, have, it could have made us, um, it could have made us in a dark place right away rather than thinking it's gonna be it's not going to be that much longer. And so that kind of got us day by day. And I think I think that was really helpful. But I what I want to say about the pandemic and the wilderness that um, that we're in is I find that I bet many people are going to redefine their lives differently. Um, who we are now and who we are after the pandemic and what are the things that we saw in our lives that we don't it doesn't serve us well anymore. And um, what are the things that um, we want to leave behind on this in this threshold that we're on? We want to leave this stuff behind. It doesn't serve us well any longer. We want to move forward, and we're going to take some of the things that we gained in this wilderness uh, forward with us. And that's that's a powerful thing because we find ourselves in this wilderness a lot as alone alone by ourselves well with god or whoever your higher power is but really we're alone it's hard to take anybody else with us because no one really understands exactly what we're experiencing in our loneliness and so i think that part of it is really difficult for people a lot of people don't like being alone with themselves and the self reflection a lot of people have never taught self reflection we're taught that I don't, they don't understand even what does it mean to self-reflect? What does it mean to contemplate life? And how do we find ourselves in the midst, finding our true identity? Like I was saying, I was trying to find my true self and a new identity for myself. I think it's important for us to name our loneliness, to say, this is what I'm missing. What is it that I'm really missing in this wilderness? What is it that I'm leaving behind that that I don't wanna leave behind? What are the things I really need and what are the things I desire? And I think um, only we can answer that. And that's why the alone time is so important. And I think, um, uh, I think we can get help with that as well. We can get help from, and even though we're Zooming, we've had, at church we've had great Zooming times and we've become so much 
deeper connected because actually a lot of times we only see each other on Sunday mornings and it's like this passing trying to how your kids are doing blah you know and just is passing on a Sunday morning but the zoom has made us understand each other better and we're starting to know more about each other's lives we have one zoom that we just sit and talk about we have a question for a week and it's just a fun question and we laugh and have fun and we learn things about each other and our youth and the things that we used to do as kids. So a lot of people don't, they don't like Zoom because it is technology and it's not the same as being in person, but it's better than nothing at all. And I think that's a really important in this time um, to be connected, uh, like Dr. Lemus was saying, to be connected to each other in any way that we can find a way to stay connected. And um, that can just not even be Zoom with, you know, your friends or with your um, church members, but, but um, a counselor like Dr. Lemus, I'm sure he does online counseling now because face-to-face -face was so difficult. And so I'm sure, you know, you can put up your little business card, Dr. Lemus, and um, <laughs> have yourself um, some, maybe some people that really need to talk to you. And also pastors as well. Pastors um, always want to hear or listen to what you have to say. And um, pastors and counselors are good containers. They uh, are good containers for the things that um, you need to um, take off your chest and get out of your mind, to get out of your spirit. I, I think that's a privilege that I carry. I enjoy that. I, I feel that that's, um, it's just an honor to be able to be someone's container for their stuff that they need to just let go. And so, so in this wilderness for me, what really helped me, one of the things that really helped me was um, clinical pastoral education or CPE education. Um, and that's, um, that's um, teaching you or training you to be um, a chaplain in a clinical setting, like a hospital or a prison or um, assisted living, you know, retirement community, uh, those places. And in the clinical pastoral education that I was in, I served in the prison when I was in seminary. Uh, and I have to say that was my first paid ministry. I, that's just something I just really um, find dear and I hold dear. Um, but this one was for the hospital. I did um, the CP program over in Lutheran Hospital in Fort Wayne during my wilderness. Um, I was serving over there with Burl um, and I just wanted to Something different. I was serving at Napanee when we first came and I was trying, I wanted to try something different and there was an opening there and I went for an interview and I was accepted into the program. And what the program was so valuable to me was that each student um, that's training there or each chaplain is training um, has a supervisor and you would have these sessions with your supervisor and then you have your mentoring group, your small group with the other um, uh, chaplains in training. And every conversation that you have, every conversation that you have with a colleague or um, with a patient or with a staff member were things that you had to discuss either with when in your supervisory time and in your time with uh, your other colleagues, your chaplain and training uh, colleagues. And they were to um, they were to reveal your deepest selves, your shadow selves. Those, those things that you want to deny about yourself, those weaknesses that you have that you would rather ignore, and they would come out in the language that in the conversations that you would have, and you'd have to do verbatims. And in that, I learned so much about myself, and that really helped me in the wilderness. The supervisor walked me through. That's why I say um, to, to have somebody walk you through something is inval it's an invaluable thing, especially if you get stuck and a lot of people do get stuck in that loneliness and in that wilderness time and um and you just need a little you just need somebody to mentor or walk beside you to just to listen to what what you need to say and ask you questions to help you find the answers on your own um so what i want to say um this is really um almost finished but i want to say that what helped me another thing that really helped me was that I always remember that I never walk alone, that really the unconditional, the universe's unconditional love 
always walks with us and will always find a path to healing for us. And it's it can be through anything. You can find a path of healing. And I've already talked about some of the ways, but um, but know that that's that's such an important thing for everyone. And it doesn't matter if you have no faith tradition at all. Um, it's it's the grace of God, and um, we can't we can't deny it. And when you accept that, then you have a better you have a better feeling about where you're going and and the unknown and um, how you're feeling. And I think that's a really important for a lot of people to know that that everyone is included in that. Um, that's that's an all inclusive universal love. So really the end to it i mean i didn't really realize there was an end i was just doing the walk and i still was thinking i was going home and i was i did two years of spiritual direction training at um the anabaptist mennonite seminary where um julie's daughter is working and um and i was taking doors of opportunity and i got i was called to a church during my cp program and i was so excited and it, and it was as an interim position and um, so the C they uh, they didn't mind that I was still doing the CP program while I was interim, and that's and when I was interim, I was doing the training at the AMBS as well. Um, but I, what I found really is once I was embraced in a community as as a secure place, I I just started like pouring out love into them and them into me. And there was something really great about serving um, a greater cause and um, serving something that you loved um, that really, really started making me feel like I belonged and that I was home. And I think if you don't have any community um, like that, well, I, I welcome you to Middlebury Church of the Brethren, of course, but I'd like to speak up for Burroughs Church as well. Uh, or in any kind of community, someplace where you feel like you really belong. And that's, um, that's really, um, that, that was um, how I got there. But there was like many years of that wandering in the wilderness um, before I recognized it. So thank you for listening. I love what, I go. love what Janet said, because I could use all of her ideas to be a better human. And I think those were all really quality ideas and thoughts. So for me, so let's discuss some of the ideas about how to beat loneliness. Five easy steps. Simple, simple loneliness. People make it too complicated. It's loneliness, simple. First, find your sanity. Second, play like a child. Third, find Wilson. Fourth, be a rebel. And fifth, sing a song doesn't sound too tough, does it? Five easy steps. So let's go through each one of them. It doesn't, we won't go back over through the sanity very much, but the sanity is probably the first step, the inner power and the life energy that connections and relationships give us. That really is a focal point for beating loneliness. Sanity, again, is an acronym that stands for safety, Acceptance, nurturance, important, trust, and yes, better I'm with you than without you. Sanity is what allows for the creation of connections. And it really is essential for our physical and emotional well being. So that's our first one. The second easy step to beating loneliness is let's relearn how to play as a child. When I watch my great grandson Elliot play, I notice that he is consumed with whatever he is doing. Ever watch little children when they play? For him, there is no past or future, only the moment that's in front of him. It see, he seems fully engrossed and content to discover something new about everything that he's doing in that moment. So for us, beating loneliness is learning to rediscover that ability to get lost in something that you connect to. Create a relationship with the moment in front of you. Get into the feeling of flow. That flow, that sensation of flow, that one minute you're doing something and then you know just a couple of seconds it feels, you're at the end and four or five hours have passed. 
in that flow is to find the joy of the moment. The third one is find Wilson. And I'm sure those of you who, who watch a lot of movies, uh, you'll recognize Wilson because there was a movie called Castaway that came out ah, December 7th of 2000, starring Tom Hanks. Hanks' character is on an airline when his plane crashes over the Pacific Ocean during a storm. He, being the only survivor of the flight, washes the store on this deserted island. The movie is about how he learns to survive alone on the island. The movie is about what happens when everything we hold dear to us, everything that we hold as important is actually taken away from you. He struggles to maintain sanity in the midst of extreme isolation. So one day he's walking on the beach and he finds a Wilson volleyball that is washed ashore. He draws a face on it. And then he adds hair to it. He then names his new friend Wilson. He connects with Wilson as if he is a real person. He develops a deep connection and relationship with Wilson. Hanks creates a power and energy, a life force that is given to Wilson. And in return, he feels a power and energy, a life force coming from Wilson. This is what feeds Hank's heart, soul, and spirit. He feels a sense of sanity from the connection with Wilson. Finding and developing a connection with your Wilson becomes essential to our own survival as it became essential for Tom Hanks's survival, finding his Wilson. And then fourth, you have to just learn to be a rebel. There's a wonderful book, and it's really meant to be a business book. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she's a Harvard business graduate. But Francesca Gino wrote a book called The Talented Rebel, which identifies five core elements that talented rebels possess. She wrote a book as a guide for business, but I thought the six core elements that she presents speak to beating loneliness. Her six core elements are diversity, which means reach out to those who appear different than us, challenge yourself to think differently, curiosity, keep asking why, check things out, search for the new, children, if you remember, always to the point where you can't stand one more why, 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 but that really is part of beating loneliness. It's the curiosity. Novelty, seek out challenges. Challenge yourself to see and do things in a new way. And then there's authenticity. Be real, remain open, vulnerable in order to connect with others and learn from others. Be receptive to feedback. And finally, perspective. Constantly broaden your view of the world. Notice what others do and what others see. That to me were really the core of beating loneliness. And again, it's Gino, it's uh, Francesca Gino. And, uh, and again, the book was a business book, but it's one of those books that those core values are really important. A final strategy is to find a song that resonates with you, that speaks to you about connection and relationship. One that you, that give you the power and the energy of hope. For me, that is a song that comes from an Eagles album that was released in 1975 called One of These Nights. For those of you who are the same age I am, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The name of the particular song is After the Thrill is Gone. In the first verse that, that, that spoke to me was a verse that said, same dances in the same old shoes, some habits that you just can't lose. There's no telling what a man might lose after the thrill is gone. To me, it was telling me to remember what used to give me joy and happiness. It tells me to get back into the habit of remembering the happy times and find the happy memories of an event or an experience and then to reconnect with that feeling it used to give you. And then maybe create a symbol 
like take that you can take with you to remind you of that feeling a rock from a particular place that you were at a photo a song that connects the memory to the feeling of belonging you can also make a phone call a zoom and connect with a person who shared that memory or experience with you another verse was the flame rises but it soon descends empty pages and a frozen pen after the thrill is gone. Again, the verse tells me to remember the flame or the heat of an experience or connection that you once had. And then you write a story about it or a letter to a friend about that flame, or you call someone and share the story of the flame with them. It also reminds me of an activity uh, that used to light me up. Okay, you're looking for those things that remind you of events, activities that just kind of lit you up, such as reading a favorite book, planting flowers, dancing alone when no one is watching, singing your favorite feel-good song when no one is listening. In another verse, so you keep on singing for the sake of the song after the thrill is gone. To me, keep on singing means to not give up, to keep on looking. Keep on pushing, keep on driving, keep looking through your memory banks. Keep talking to friends or people who help you remember times and events that brought you joy. And to me, for the sake of the song means to remember the thrill, the excitement that, that came with that particular memory. Recreate that joy, the contentment and the feeling of happiness you used to feel. So. So you keep on singing for the sake of the song after the thrill is gone. These are all insights into how to beat loneliness. But in summary, in summary, I would say that one, don't give up. Instead, you rediscover your life force, your inner power, and your life energy. Finally, find the sanity in connection. Let those connections feed your heart, your soul, and your spirit. Play like a child. Focus on what you can do, not on what you should do. Capture the moment. Find the flow, just like a child does. Find your Wilson. Create and reinvigorate your inner power and your inner energy. Find your life force. Be a rebel. Find the flames that heat you up. Seek out diversity, curiosity, novelty, authenticity, and perspective. And finally, finally, sing a song and dance like no one is watching. One of my favorite memories is cleaning the house. This would be really embarrassing, guys, if anybody ever saw me or made a record of this. It, it, I'll be humiliated. But I, it's such a distinct memory because I was cleaning the house when I was watching my granddaughter and she was in her little, 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 like a little buggy. And here I was singing and dancing to Kenny Loggins' Footloose. Do you remember? Footloose, kick off the Sunday shoes. Please, Louise, pull me off of my knees. Jack, get back. Come on before we crack. Lose your blues. Everybody cut foot loose. That to me is what beating loneliness is about. So have a wonderful rest of the week. And remember, loneliness is a temporary state of mind. So you keep on singing for the sake of the song, even if the thrill is gone. All right. That's my <laughs> little piece. And I think uh, Luann is going to open it up for some suggestions or some questions. And maybe we can help those of you who, who have those questions. Luann. Uh, well, just like I said, um, I think finding community is really a, a great deal. And I was making a joke about the church. I think any community is good where you feel like you uh, want to belong. And that to take every, when you're lonely and opportunities come your way, don't let the loneliness get in the way um, to um, accept opportunities and try new things. And I think um, that was what really helped me. I just kept answering the call to an opportunity and I would just try it. Whatever door um, was the right door, I knew what was the right thing for me. You both have given us so much to think about. Thank you. Obviously with this pandemic, it's, it, we're slowly kind of working our way out and becoming still socially distanced, but still um, 
gathering smallly, or I guess in small numbers. Do you, what's the time frame? Do you think that mental, our mental health, our loneliness will be back to normal per se? Because I think being socially isolated for about a year takes a, a toll on one's mental health, and it's not like a light switch you can just turn on and off. Ted, I think that's a great question because like I said in the beginning, loneliness really is a very temporary state, right? It takes a while for people to get in there that comes from the isolation, from the distance and from the separation. And it's one of those kind of things that once you start creating more connections, once you start eliminating the isolation, once there is distance, but not as much distance, truly that loneliness lifts. And I think it lifts pretty rapidly once you start being active at addressing it. It's when you don't address it. It's when you really start to disconnect from yourself, right? You just don't have a motivation. And you find that as we get older, we want to do it. We just don't seem to have the motivation to do it. And that's what happens when you start to move into a, a deep anxiety or severe depression. But I'm telling you, once you start those processes, it's amazing how quickly the system finds its level of stability again. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit when, when people feel so alone and they want to take the pain away that they uh, turn to whatever makes them feel better. Usually some kind of something they put in their bodies or um, a substance. Could, could you just speak to a possible way to overcome that? Uh, Luann, one of the things we know is that as human beings, we just don't tolerate pain, right? Pain is the one thing that hurts so deeply that we're driven to things that whether they're good or they're bad, we're driven to relieve the pain. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people good ways of relieving the pain. Yes, pills will relieve the pain. You know, shopping will, repeat, reveal, uh, will relieve some of the pain. Uh, different kinds of drugs, sex, there's all kinds of things that relieve the pain. And those kinds of, of activities are effective. They just aren't good for our heart, our soul, and our spirit necessarily, right? So we're trying to give people mm -hmm. some different things. And some of the things that I mentioned earlier, right? Some of those pieces about uh, finding a way to, um, let me see, let me real quickly, yeah. When we talk about the different ways of relieving pain, it really is about finding your sanity, play like a child, find Wilson, be a rebel, and sing a song. Those are more of constructive ways, but they do take a little longer. They really do. The other ones are very quick, very fast, and very effective. And these literally require a little bit more energy and a little bit more effort, a little bit more thought to be able to put them into play. Mm. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. And I was thinking as you were going through all those points of the letters of sanity, like the support groups are include a lot of those elements. Um, so yeah, perhaps being in a support group yeah. would give some, yeah, strength. Yeah. And Luann, that really is. I mean, if you can connect with people, it doesn't matter if it's through Zoom or whether you do it in person or having distance. It, we as human beings really need those experiences. We need to have people that we're around that we feel safe with, that we have this level mm -hmm. of acceptance where people see us as people. That means they consider what we feel, right? People who mm -hmm. nurture us. Sometimes just being around people fill us up. You know, just being close to people. And then a sense where we're around people where I feel important. The people know my name, right? It's like that cheers bar. You know, you go someplace where everybody knows your name. It's about being able to feel a sense of importance, of value, worth, and significance. 
And again, it's about a support group where you find people whom you trust. You can depend that they're going to care for your feelings and they care about what you really think. And then people that you really can say, yes, I'm better with them than without them. Mm -hmm. I took a note on, on something um, earlier in the presentation, which I thought was really good. And that was um, the point that it's important to name our loneliness that uh, to think, you know, what is it that I have really been missing? You know, and whether that's family or travel or whatever it is. Uh, but the concern I have is you might be able to name your loneliness, name what you're missing and still not be able to do it. You might not be able to travel. You might want more closeness with your family members, but, uh, but perhaps that's just not possible right now. So, so what do you do when you have these feelings of loneliness, but can't you know, move ahead immediately? And those of you who've worked with me and ACT know I'm not a very patient person. You know, I want things done right now. But, um, you know, but we all have had to slow down, you know, a little bit and, and realize we can't always do the things we want to do as soon as we want to do them. But that's hard. So, so what do you have to tell yourself about, you know, how you might not really be able to immediately, you know, embrace those things which you've really been missing. How, how do you work through that? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking um, it's probably my own personality, but I would try to create my own opportunities. Um, as far as travel, I don't know, maybe I would plan a trip and I would see how much everything cost and I would say what's the most beautiful uh, one of the one of the things I would love to do is see every beautiful sunset in the United States and uh, there's actually a top 10 list um, and so you know I went and checked them out and Burl and I are talking about like doing that kind of trip as soon as we're able as soon as I I retire we're talking about going out to California there's four of them just in California so uh it's just a way for me to like take myself out of my situation into something like I can dream about. And um, as, as far as my, I think the people, the people I miss the most are probably my, my grandkids. Um, and I have uh, uh, three grandkids back East. And uh, so I do a lot to zoom with uh, them, you know, with their, their, my, my daughter and, um, them together so that that helps me before years ago like when I was going through my own loneliness um yeah I would just jump in the car and go see them because we didn't have zoom and we didn't have uh we didn't really have too much uh FaceTime or anything and so uh now I feel like it's more of a blessing um because of technology it's been really a lot helpful but my whole thing is I would create my own I would create my own dreams inside of my, you know, inside of my space where um, I had, and that's uh, I'm sure a non-clinical, <laughs> non-clinical answer, but uh, yeah, it's just sometimes that's what you have to do. To name it, then I think it's to remember that it is. It's just this is just a temporary state of being. It's just temporary. It, and then I always use with a lot of my clients what I do is I always use this example of that when you're gonna do something, you don't have to eat the whole chicken, you know? You can take the pieces of the chicken that you like and put the other pieces aside. And sometimes it's about not swallowing the feathers, just get to the meat of the things that really can help you move it forward. And then it really is about movement. Sometimes you just have to move your body. Once you start moving your body, then a lot of times your brain kind of goes with you and then it just becomes one step and then another step and another step. To tell us a, a short story in kind of regards to that, um, there was a pastor who's out in California and she was talking about 
how lonely she was and she was worried about her son because he just didn't really you know just ha didn't have a good history about being alone and he lived alone in a different town and she said she wanted to go see him so she decided she was going to break her you know just her um, stay at home and she was going to go visit him for the weekend and he loves to bake and she said when she got there he told her how he was um he decided that he was going to have a bakery right outside of his house and um, he set up a bakery and every Saturday morning uh, the, um, he would have it all set up and he would charge and he said he would only charge what it cost him to make these baked goods right and people would stop he said he would have like all these all these new, all these customers from his neighborhood would come and he would bake like scones and sourdough bread I mean just really just wonderful different baked goods and she said when she went to see him and she said and it was Saturday morning at 3 a.m and I could smell the smells coming up to my bedroom and she said it gave me such pleasure because she said all the years I ever worried about him she said in that just one moment she thought how wonderful it was for Grace right and so <laughs> People are doing the things that they love, but they're being creative. Um, they're creating their own opportunities to, to do something. And he saw that as a way to serve the people in his neighborhood. And so I, I thought that was a great story. Mm. So the last time I went to visit my grandson, I snitched one of his little t-shirts and I brought it back. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so when Ever I miss him, I can just, ah, you know, and I think this is a, a good trick getting over our, our loneliness for somebody is, you know, ask people to send you a piece of their clothing, <laughs> not wearing anymore and has not yet washed, but you know. Oh, so they're right there with you. That's a great idea. That's awesome. I think that's a great idea too. And I, I really love what you said earlier that sometimes part of moving forward is to serve others. It really is to move the focus so much away from yourself to helping another person, help another soul, help another human being. And that again is part of what gives you that inner power, that life energy, that life force that you're doing something for good. Uh, what you're having to say, um, and Janet knows me quite well. I'm the person that goes back and forth maybe 40 times to Vietnam. And uh, I, you know, I, I came back here April 3, April the 3rd, 2019. Um, and I haven't been back to Vietnam since then. Um, and I kind of, through this uh, pandemic, I kind of really felt like I will probably never go back to Vietnam again. That's how I felt maybe up to two months ago. But then all of a sudden, as this whole vaccination, able to have uh, access to that and all that, I'm having that desire to take the trip again. But this time I want to take somebody with me to Vietnam because uh, I, I was there, Janet knows that, I was there 20 years, uh, you might say, <laughs> off and on, uh, setting up programs, project initiatives related to uh, blind communities because I have low vision. And so from a low vision perspective, it gets, you have a double whammy in that uh, you need the, p the community to be your eyes. And so um, one thing I had, I had to think of, uh, uh, Frank, when you were talking and mentioned, I, I, I carried this teddy bear back and forth to Vietnam at, mm -hmm. for 20 years. And one night I said, okay, Teddy, you know a lot of secrets about me being in Vietnam. And I ended up, Teddy and I, we, I, turned, I turned on some jazz that we would have it at the <laughs> coffee bean in uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And I started to dance with my, my teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful story. I, I was there in 69 and I, it, 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 I never even had the thought of ever wanting to go back. But after I, ta I talked to people who've been there, oh, yeah. and it would just be a wonderful experience. I, I still get kind of, my stomach feels weird to even think about going back there. But when I hear you talk about it and I hear other people who've gone back, 
I mean, it's it, it, it really helps ones. I, I had somebody that from Washington that came when I was there and the, the wife was so glad because then he got himself off of the Thoracines when he came back because it, he had a great experience. They, they, you know, like we, we get, oh, how are they going to feel about us? We're their enemies. And they receive us. And, yeah. and, and, and relationships are formed. There's hugging and crying. Yeah, yeah. That's a great, that's a great story. I think that would be beautiful to do. That that. I love the teddy bear. I love the teddy bear. I can really <laughs> relate to that, Grace. That's with my Kenny Loggins uh, footloose thing. So yes. <laughs> One thing that I hope in our act group and and every, in this meeting tonight, I hope we all felt that um, we were among friends and um, that, yeah, we, we, we want to hear all of your experiences. Um, I feel like I could tell my life story to um, Janet. Um, and so um, I hope that um, some of these relationships can keep going. I want to thank um, Frank, Dr. Lamus, um, Frank and Janet very much for giving us your time tonight. Um, thank you for everyone who tuned in.